I'll go ahead and show you where the uh, cheat sheet is. If you go to pick a random page, I'll get off the front page so I don't have trouble. If you hit edit, there's all this stuff here that's distracting you. Down here on the bottom right is help editing. That, that won't take you directly to the cheat sheet, but it gets you closer. You click on the editing cheat sheet, the editing uh, help, and inside there, there's the Wikipedia cheat sheet. Yeah. Every time you hit edit, that link should be at the bottom. And if you haven't done it, you can always, rather than have it in a new tab, you can always do a right click and select open a new window. And that sometimes, especially if you have, if you're lucky enough to have two displays or a really wide one, yeah, it gets really frustrating when you're trying to tab around and remember stuff. And the notes from the last time from that tiny URL thing, did that, mm -hmm. was that temporary or can we always go back to that? As long as tiny URL stays in business, I believe that URL will hang out. Okay. Yeah. So most likely for the duration of this class. Yeah. Yeah. The only trouble is if you move a page with a tiny URL, the, it'll still point to the old spot. So it doesn't follow a document, it just okay. points into space yeah. if, right. if it moves. Okay. We're getting trouble because we have what's called a NAT, network alias, where all of our accounts, all these machines come through and look like they come from one computer going out to the internet. So we're paying a price for, for doing that because it thinks we're all the same person on the same computer. And so it thinks there's you know 30 people on the IRC channel from the same computer. Okay, so you did an attach first. Well, I went into the free node. I just double clicked on it, and then I went into the attach panel. Okay. And I just is it actually in the list there? I did a quick search, and it just came up with it. Yeah. yeah, it should show up in search, but if you just do an attach, so if you do a joint, we definitely need to set up our own IRC server here soon. Uh, so free node, it's attached, then join. There we go. So tools, Chatzilla. So we'll do attach IRC free node.net. So you do the attach first, it's probably going to complain. And then you would do a join, a pound, or a hash character, and then UNH research tools. Uh, because you're inside of CCOM, you should be able to remote desktop from these machines directly to your desktop. Is, there, is anybody still waiting to connect in? We probably have a couple, Ben. Okay. You're connecting on your phone? Yeah. Is there an easy way to figure out your computer name? I mean, I'm, in, I'm into the uh, server, but I can't seem to get connected to our group. Do you not know your fish name for your desktop? No. Uh oh. You need to memorize that. Okay. It's important. I, 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 it'll be a lot of fish names. So you'll have to guess which fish is yours. It won't have my name assigned to it. No, that would be too easy. Is that the little name that printed on your actual computer? Yes. Like yeah. yeah, some of them are unpronounceable fish names and yes. If you guys can't make it into the RC channel today, look over your neighbors and if you have a question, ask your neighbor to type it in for you. I will try to have an IRC server set up inside our firewall that we won't have this kind of issue with. Well, let's go ahead and get started because today's going to be a short day. Item number three is that I have to run over to James Hall. If you want to go see me talk yet again, I'm giving the brown bag seminar in James Hall for the earth science department. And I'll be talking about paleomagnetics and stratigraphy, a little less about the computers and a lot more about geology and geophysics. But today I'd like to get you guys into a topic that's really important for the rest of the semester and it gives you the freedom to not be stuck in this classroom or inside of CECOM. We're going to go ahead and get you started on virtual machines. You're going to download a virtual machine. So it's this file that's going to be a, basically 
an entire operating system inside of a window for you, you can take that file, once you, if you shut down that computer in quotes, and turn it off, you can copy that file anywhere else and run it from a different computer, and it will look like an entire computer inside of that. If you have a thumb drive, or I have a USB drive here, you can just take that, put that file on the drive there, take it with you, take it to C, and that computer follows you around. For example, if you have a whole bunch of desktops that you're working on on a ship, even if they're not networked together, you can take a USB drive with you, and on that USB drive can be your entire work environment. So you unplug, and everything will go with you. To get to it, we need to go, if you go to the Research Tools website, so all of you hopefully have bookmarked this or have it handy. If you don't, I will create a tiny URL. This time I'm not going to bother to make it pretty. This link right here, tinyurl.com slash 3mgtkgy, very memorable, will get you right to the, the research tools page. To be honest, I haven't done a lot of this virtual machine stuff in the past where I've had to go and do more than the basics. So for you guys, I'm starting to learn some of the better tricks like how to make a smaller virtual machine, but I'm not very good at it yet. So our image is pretty large. We're going to be downloading a four gigabyte file. If you scroll down, I don't have a nice link for it yet. Right near the bottom, there is a link called virtual dash machines. Click on that. And throughout the semester, I'm going to be uploading new virtual machines. I'm going to have to delete the old ones eventually because there's only so much disk space on the server and they do add up quickly if you have a lot of them. But if you look here, they'll be named with the year, the month, and the day for the directory so that you can figure out which one you've got and which one's new. And I'll try to be good about and also name the files with the timestamp for that virtual machine so that you can look at the one you've got, see if it, there's a newer one, and download it. So download these two files. There's a VMDK and a VMX. One of them is really big, 4 gigabytes. The other one is a really small, 2.8K. Download those two files, and I suggest just putting them on your desktop for now. Treat these files as disposable. If you don't like them, delete them, start again. If they blow up on you and something screws up, these are the files that you can delete and start over. But also remember, when you're inside that virtual machine, if you start doing important work for your classes or for anything else, back that data up somewhere else too. Because a virtual machine is easy to kill and it kills everything very fast. Deleting one four gigabyte file goes like a snap and it's all gone. Make sure you back things up. We're gonna work through more strategies throughout the semester on backing up. Go ahead and start downloading that and we'll see how our network does with 15 or so people all downloading four gigabytes at the same time. <laughs> when you're using a web browser to get files that are binary, the safest thing to always do is to right click rather than left click and do save link as. On Windows that you can also hold down the option key and it will just immediately download the file without trying to view it. You don't want to view these files. If you view them, what you see won't be that helpful. Either you're going to see binary data from the actual virtual machine or you're going to see the insides of the configuration file. So do a save link as. I wonder if Will's upstairs stressing out watching the network. I see a little bit of progress here. I see 12 and 13 minutes. Ouch. 20 minutes. So we'll go ahead, keep letting that going. Um, I will show you some of the basics. We'll run through it once, give it a go. Or if you guys would like, if you have questions from last lecture, if you want to see some of the examples run through again or ask about any of the commands, now would be a great time when the network is completely clobbered and the entire building is probably screaming in agony because they don't know why everything is going slow for them too. So if you guys have any questions on the command line using the Unix man program to get man pages or getting help from tools with dash dash help, feel free to shout them out or put them in the IRC if you've made it into the IRC channel. I see a good number of you have made it onto IRC. Are all those man pages going to be in the virtual machine? Are all those man pages going to be in the virtual machine. They should be. And in fact, 
what you were logging into called research tools was a virtual machine. You just didn't know it. So it's sitting on a server somewhere else, but that server actually hosts quite a number of virtual machines. So it's actually serving data up to Cape Cod and talking to ships. It's doing stuff for the IT team. There's little computers on there. There are these little virtual machines that are all taking care of stuff. We've got a very similar virtual machine running on that. When you do it here, you'll have more because we've installed the graphical interface. This image is about four gigabytes. The other image, I think, is currently just under a gigabyte. So we don't have all the graphical tools installed on that one. So there'll be more on what you get in the desktop. Good question. I'll go ahead and give you guys a run through unless there's any more questions. As we go through, if I use a command I haven't told you, which I do, will probably do a lot of just by accident, don't hesitate to shout out questions. Let's jump in and just take a quick look at the virtual machine. I'll show you setting it up. When it gets downloaded onto your machine, then we'll run through with all of you guys. So what I've done is I've created a folder. I just named it with the virtual machine to make life easier. I've run it once, so ignore all this extra junk. It's created a lot of temporary files in there that you really don't care about. But there's a tool called VMware Player. And if your machine, yeah, you're using a non-CCOM machine, it very likely doesn't have VMware Player on it. If you go to v and just Google for VMware Player, you should be able to download a free player right away. It'll do the same thing. So if I double click on this, it's already got my virtual machine loaded up in here. But if I hadn't done that, I'm going to say skip this version. We have IT, the IT team manages the software here. If I try to do the update version, it's not going to let me. So I'm going to skip that. We'll ask them to do it. What you'll do is you go under File, and you'll say Open a Virtual Machine. You'll navigate to where that virtual machine is, and it's going to show you, it's going to take those two files you're downloading, treat them as one virtual machine. They go together as a pair. You'll select that and hit Open. So that'll put it up in a display like this where you can see the Play Virtual Machine link right here is a quick link to start it up and edit virtual machine settings. So I'm going to walk you through this and we're going to come back and have to, to tweak your virtual machine a little bit. I'm still perfecting what I do. Here you can control how much resources from your computer you're going to give to this little virtual machine. You can give it a lot or you can give it nothing. And you can actually give it more resources than you have and get yourself in trouble. For example, here with memory, I've assigned it one gigabyte, so that's 1024 megabytes. It'll let me go up to 32 gigabytes, and it's going to have to create virtual RAM on the disk, and it's going to go really slow. And you can control the number of processors. So here I've given it a gigabyte of RAM and the effectively two processors. I believe these computers have four cores, so you can give it up to four. I would suggest not giving it all of your processing power. This will allow it to have up to a 20 gigabyte disk to get going. And then there's lots of other parameters that we can go through later on. But the key one to go down to is display. This is the one that's the most important to the set that I haven't done in this virtual machine yet, just because I didn't have time. And that's turn on accelerate 3D graphics. We haven't done much graphics yet, but there are a few programs that you'll run, like Google Earth. If you don't have accelerated 3D graphics turned on, they'll run really slow. So anything that's actually a 3D program will have a hard time. And after you do that, the, uh, you'll probably have an Apply button. So well, I'm just going to hit OK. And I'm going to go ahead and launch the virtual machine, which is also called Play. If you have multiple virtual machines running, you can only have the sum of the resources that the machine that they're actually running. Yeah, there's no magical way to get more resources. So what you can allocate to each thing, if you've got a lot of virtual machines you want to run, you're going to want to set them to one or two cores. There may be some other ways to improve how well it runs to let them all play together nicely. For now, you're typically going to only run one or two virtual machines at a time. There are really fancy tools that, like the enterprise version that we run upstairs, which is VMware ESX, and that gives you really fine-grained control for a lot of virtual machines. We definitely have servers that can run 20, 30 virtual machines. Some of those virtual machines are doing very little. If you try and run a whole bunch of them doing a lot, they're going to fight with each other and go really slow. Inside the virtual machine, you'll often get a pop-up like this about updates to the VMware tools. So there's special tools that go inside this program that talk 
outside. What we have here is a, a little terminology problem that can get confusing is you have host and guest. In the classroom here, this is going to be Windows. This is what you sit down on, so Windows 7 in our case. And the guest is the virtual machine. So this is your VM or virtual machine. There's software that runs here. This is the VMware player. And in our case, we're going to be running Ubuntu Linux. Inside of this operating system, which normally could take over an entire machine, has special drivers that make it talk more effectively with VMware. And that pop-up you're seeing in front of me that I've got right there, where it says VMware Tools for Linux version 8.4.4. This is a driver that runs on the Ubuntu Linux that lets it talk more effectively with what's going on on the Windows side. So these two know about each other. Most of the software you run in the virtual machine really has no idea that it's on a virtual machine. And in fact, if you're writing Python code, that Python code will have no idea that it's in a little special container. It, it'll ha be happy and think that it's got a full normal computer, which is the, the wonder of virtual machines and why they work so well. It does have a version of the software that's good enough for now, so I'm going to say, remind me later. And hopefully the next time I give you guys a virtual machine, I will go update it right before I send it to you. And what I've done here is, in setting it up, I used an account that was my own. But I've created a research tools account that you all have the password to. It's an administrator. And this is not something, if you have a machine on the network, don't do this. Shared passwords are a really bad idea. In class, we're going to use this for just getting started. And what you do with a virtual machine normally is, you download it, and then you change the password. You, you maybe even delete that account, create an account with your username and a password for you that is completely different than what's here. If you keep a machine running with this and you leave it around, that means that anybody who knows about this virtual machine knows that password, and very bad things can happen. But in this case, you, when you get the virtual machine, this is the password that you're going to have. It's uh, exclamation point RT for research tools. 2011 VM. So whenever I distribute a virtual machine for this class, the username is going to be research tools and the password is going to be this. In the future we'll go through how to create users. So you'll create yourself a username and you can go and delete this user. And then if you want to give the virtual machine to someone else, you can go cre recreate this account very easily and then hand the file off to someone else. If you've made a special virtual machine that's all set up for some particular task, you can share that with other people. So unlike before, we had to use PuTTY to log in. This is like you're sitting at the console. And as long as my mouse is in that window, it's as if I'm typing on that computer. So I can then type the exclamation point RT 2011 VM and hit login. Now it's going to look different than when we logged into the server because we're logging into a graphical interface much like Windows. So things are going to start looking a little bit different. And we can actually uh, make this pretty much full screen. It, it'll feel a little weird. This will just sort of hide the window stuff away from us. And we're in a completely different operating system. And it has different ways of interacting that are similar to Windows, but different enough that they may trip you up. There's a couple tabs in the top left. Right now, we're running in an older style of the Ubuntu interface. There's a fancier one that requires 3D graphics that I haven't quite figured out how to enable. So it'll look fancier, more Windows 7-like, if I can figure out how to turn that on. It's called Unity. But inside of here, I've pre-installed a fairly large bit of software to get you guys going, so that the first thing you aren't doing is learning how to install software to be able to just get going. I'll show you a little bit today, but you'll be able to do things like open up a calculator, not very exciting. Open up a text editor. So we'll, we'll be going into GNU Emacs. A uh, text editor will pop open. It's very similar to Mac OS and Windows, where in the top left corner, if you want to kill something, you can click the little X and it goes away. And if you want the, the interface to look very much like what we had before with the server that we logged into, under Accessories, there is a terminal. And at least here, I know how to make the font bigger. So now you can do those commands we learned before. For example, we can do a PWD. And we're now in Home Research Tools. We can make, der, make a directory called test, make der test. 
cd into test, do another pwd and see that we're now on a directory. We can do a long listing and see that there's nothing but the dot and the dot dot directory aliases in there. And we can say cd tilde to go back home. Now there's a fair bit more going on with what's in your folder. So it's set up to be a full desktop environment. So if you want to load up your entire music album into a folder, it's all set up for that. We're going to treat this as a work machine rather than uh, learn how to play all the fun stuff with music and whatnot. Certainly we won't get into that stuff. But if you do an ls-la in this machine, you're going to see a whole lot of extra stuff running around in here. Don't worry about too much of it. This is all the configuration information for the windows, windowing interface and all of the devices and your entire environment being set up. So there's lots of, they're called dot files that are hiding around taking care of things for you. The windowing interface that is being used is called GNOME. It's spelled G-N-O-M-E. And you'll be seeing some of that. Don't worry too much about that interface. I think you'll be able to, after a few minutes, guess what you need to find where and you'll get comfortable pretty quickly switching between Windows and Linux without too much worry. How are you guys doing on the downloads? I see about a third of the way through. Yes? Which software did you use to create this version? I used the VMware system itself to create it. So what I did is I downloaded an install disk for Ubuntu and ran the VMware player. I believe you can do it with VMware player. You can, I believe, create one. So you can say create new virtual machine, and if you have the install disk for your operating system, you can put that either as a physical disk in or if it's a file that you download. Like for Linux, it'll be uh, the equivalent of a CD, which is called an ISO image. So there'll be one big file that you install from. You'll tell it which file to install from, and it will do the operating system install as if you were on the console installing it inside that little window. We can go through that later in the class so that you guys can create your own virtual machines if you need something different. There's lots of different types of Linux, and if you have a favorite one, you can switch. We have a finished one. Yeah. Okay, that means everyone else gets to go faster soon. I think in future classes, we'll try to have uh, some other strategy for getting you the, the images a little bit faster so we can have them ready to go before class. So while that's going, I'm going to show you what it's like to start up Python. This is the programming language we're actually going to spend most of our time on in this class. And we're going to use a tool called IPython. It's a little bit enhanced version of Python. So that's the letter I before Python. And IPython is designed to be more of a, an entire work environment where you can play with stuff as it goes. You can make plots. and if I type PyLab after it, I'm going to start up with a whole scientific programming environment. It's designed specifically for science. The first time you run it, IPython says I'm setting up a whole bunch of stuff for you. It's going to keep histories just like the Bash shell did. It's going to let you keep a history of what's going on, scroll through things, and try to keep track of your environment. I'll hit Enter. And you can do things like before. We did a PWD. You can do an ls, and you can cd into our test directory, things like that. So it gives you a lot of what you would have in your normal bash shell. You can actually run scripts from inside of this. And Python normally doesn't give you that, so you have to sort of have a shell open and do shell type stuff with regular Python and the regular Python itself. This combines them together, and it gives you graphing. So we'll get a complete environment where you can actually spend your entire day in this little terminal doing data processing and analysis. Yeah. I see virtual machines starting up. This is pretty exciting. Anticipation helps make it exciting, it's right? Those files on the desktop, will it, recognize? it sees them as a pair if you do open. They just need to be right next to each other. They can be in a folder or they can be anywhere you want as long as they're next to you. Yeah. Will these images work on a Mac? Yeah. That's where they were built. They're actually built on a Mac. So even though I'm showed up there the VMware player, I have VMware Fusion, and that's where I do most of my development. And that's the great part of VMware is that as long as you have the required virtual machine infrastructure, it doesn't matter. Now, you can run a Mac inside of a virtual machine, but then you're breaking the rules. <laughs>
he's probably just getting clobbered right now. I was on them when I first got in, but so go ahead and run that, and then do the open. You're getting three minutes, getting closer, and two virtual machines. If you have the virtual machine, go ahead and log in, if you can figure out how to do that. So, first you need to open VMware Player. You open VMware Player. And open, open this through here. You can either click Open Virtual Machine or File Open. It's the same thing. And then you have to go navigate to wherever that is, like your desktop. And it should just see it there, yep. Okay. And you click open, and it should load it up. You don't need to do the configuration that I walked you through, but I wanted you to at least see it. Just hit play if you, when it, if it comes up. Uh, where did you place the files? You need to download both files. There's two. There's the VMDK, which is the big, giant four gigabytes. You also need to download the little VMX configuration file. Oh, yes. If you get a question that says, did you move it or copy it, you copied it. So you click the, I copied it. If you click the move, it probably will work. I'm just not sure what it's doing, but either one will probably get you going. Did anyone try, I moved it? I would suggest doing the, I copied it. What about the keyboard hook timeout? That's another one. If you see the keyboard hook timeout or uh, warning, just click OK and don't worry about it. And when you get to the VMware tools installed, just say, remind me later. Being lazy sometimes is good. And the password if you've, is right up there. And this is something that I'm going to actually post this password on the internet. It's going to be in the recorded lectures. This is not a secure password in any means. I'm sorry it's so slow getting going. It's all the basics to, to get things set up before we need to do fun stuff. You need to download the VMX. There's a VMX configuration file if you go to the web page. You download the same file two times. You need to download two different files. So there's a VMDK, this one. Go back to the web site, yeah. and there's the VMX. Save that file, save link as, and they need to be in the same directory together, the same folder. Click open, and now hit play. Off you go. Okay. You copied it? And remind me later in OK. Yeah, so click OK. And remind me later, this one. Yep, so remind me later. And now go ahead and log in. Excellent, this is looking good. And you're now booting up. So you'll log in once you see the, the screen come up. Excellent, we have everybody logged into Linux. And one person actually running full Linux. Now you're gonna find something. For Machine so that we are in, that we're connecting to this machine. This virtual machine is running on this desktop. So you're, this is not the research tools server that we used before. It was a totally new place to be. Or did I miss your question? <laughs> yes. So you log into the virtual machine, and you're in a what looks like a terminal, but that terminal is, is attached to the current machine. You're not going out over the network at all. all right. If you took these computers and unplugged them from the network, this would still work. So you're not talking to any computer out, out there. This is running right on this desktop where you are. Don't try to, we will eventually run Chatzilla inside the virtual machine. But for now, we're going to cause Freenode to freak out with even more people logged into IRC through multiple ways. So don't worry about Chatzilla right now. We'll get that figured out uh, for the next time. So one thing you're going to discover pretty quickly is this virtual machine is set up for security. So if I walk away too long, it wants my password again. You'll get to know the password pretty quickly every time you do some thinking. I'm going to remove the setup files for IPython. If you go up to Applications on the top left, 
under accessories, there is a terminal. And unlike PuTTY, we're connecting to the machine that we're on. So it's it's going to show you it's going to show you the research tools. This is the username, and then it's telling you the host name, which is just Ubuntu. So it's pretty boring. And if you do a print working directory, you'll see that you're in home research tools. Eventually, you'll create a user for yourself. We'll be connecting up to outside resources and pulling in files that we need. And the nice thing about this account is it starts you off as administrator. So on these Windows computers, you have permission to do very little. You can't install software. You can't do all sorts of stuff. Inside this virtual machine, you have full control, which means you can destroy it pretty quickly. You can get yourself pretty confused. But you can also learn how to do stuff. It's OK to make mistakes inside the virtual machine. If things break, you can delete the virtual machine, download it again from the web, and start over. So don't feel bad if, in learning how to use this virtual machine, things go wrong a few times. The main thing is to use those experiences to, fig to figure out yourself or to ask somebody, what went wrong, and how do I not do that next time? You need a place where you can try stuff out without fear of you know, the house coming down on you. So I'm actually going to show you, I'll go through this together, I'll make my terminal bigger, how to do a little bit of system administration and start looking at some data. So I'm going to say zoom in. And last time I showed you a tool called SoCat. If you type SoCat and hit enter, it's going to say, ah, that's not here. But the neat about Linux is that it assumes that you might be the administrator for this computer and actually knows that you're the administrator and that you could install it if you needed it. And it's going to tell you the command to run. And that command is right here. So if you do a funny thing called sudo, and then you run a program called apt-get install socat, it's going to go out to the internet and from a trusted site get you this program. So you haven't gone out, you haven't risked getting any viruses. This is software that's pretty pretty safe to run, or at least to install. And we'll go through what these tools do. For now, we're just going to take it as this is how you install something. It's going to say, please type in your password. So you're, it wants to, to get access to the system. And since you're the administrator, you can do that. We'll type our research tools password, bang rt 2011 vm Hit Enter. And it's going to go out and grab you the latest version of that software that it has available. It's going to do a lot of stuff that doesn't really have to mean anything to you right now. But at the end, if we type SoCat, it says, hey, I'm running. You didn't give me any options that help. I'm here, but I didn't understand you. If you want to continue, say yes to continue. What happens is that sometimes if you install software, that software depends on other software. You have this whole tree of people working together. And it's going to tell you, I need to install these couple tools to be able to give you SoCat that works. And if you were to do this administration on your own, which a lot of people really like to do, you come back about five hours later and you still be figuring out how to install all those tools. It's a good lesson, but questions? Um, mine won't let me type in the password. If you hit Control C. Oh, it doesn't show up, but it. It's go ahead and type something. So your keyboard's working. Anytime you see a password prompt, if you start seeing characters that are your password, stop. Your password shouldn't appear unless you ask it to appear. If your password starts appearing when you type into something, it means that either there's something doing something bad or you're not doing what you think you're doing. Sometimes it's possible that it's the right thing, but go find an IT person who's comfortable with that to tell you whether or not when you start seeing your password going in that it, it's something that really, really should be doing. So now we have this SoCat program in there. And if we do SoCat, and we're going to do a connection, I'll teach you guys later on what this is all doing. But if we say data logger1.ccom.nh, and then we're going to give it a port number of 36,000, a dash to say I'd like it. So that's a minus sign on there. That's going to put the output to the standard out, which is the console. You can also send that output to files, to other computers. It's really powerful. We won't get into too much of that. And if we do a vertical bar and head, the vertical bar means send the data to another program. And we're going to use this head program to only give us the first 10 lines so it doesn't just keep scrolling by and go crazy. If you're brave, go ahead and hit Enter. 
Where's the vertical bar? The vertical bar is right above your return key. If you hit hold down shift, there should be between backspace and enter should be a vertical bar. It's otherwise known as a pipe. And what you're seeing up here is data coming from our, the roof of our building from an AirMar weather sensor slash uh, GPS that you would have on your ship. We put one on the building so it would match what people put on their ships. And then this head program just took the first 10 lines and then quit. And so there's a little error from SOCAT where it tried to send us more data and it said there's a broken pipe and it's unhappy. There's lots of funny analogies in Unix about pipes and plumbing and things like that. Uh, we'll, we'll see more of those as we go. And we'll walk through some of that so you start getting a sense of how these things work. But now you've at least seen, you can hook up to live data in this tool and start working with it. Lots of people having trouble. Okay. So cat, aha. There's a, a problem that I talked about last time. When you write data logger, and then there's a, some character right after that, if I write it up on the whiteboard, my L's have loops, and my, or a big loop, my 1's shouldn't have a loop, and they should have a little bar underneath. That's a 1 at the end. The joy of some fonts, if you look really closely up here, data logger with the, with the L character, this has a bar across the bottom. Their L on this font has got a little half bar. If you don't look really carefully, 1's and L's will definitely get confusing. So cat. We do man so cat. Multi-purpose relay socket cat. I'm not sure that's going to help you a whole lot. <laughs> By the end of the semester, that might mean something to you, and it'll be a helpful thing. But right now, it's just called so cat. That's why we have notes. And so when you work through things, you take notes and you figure it out, and eventually it'll start meaning something. But right now, socket cat is not terribly helpful, I would imagine. And cat doesn't have anything to do with dog either. But with Unix and Linux, you're building up little pieces and those pieces, the more pieces you have, the more powerful your skills are. So every time you add a little piece, it's more than just adding that piece, it's the whole combination of powerful tools that start building up this library of things that you can conquer some data. Is anyone still stuck on the SOCAT and have, hasn't had it run successfully? I see lots of success. So that's it for today. It's a short class. Next week, we'll dig even more into this and we'll start using the text editor if you want to play with it and take a peek. It's called Emacs and it's right there. So GNU Emacs. There's many Emacs. They're not all the same. The one we are going to use is GNU Emacs version. And this 23, that's the version number. This tool has been around since the 1970s. It's only gotten more powerful. And this is opposed to, if you ever hear someone say VI, that's a different editor, and we won't talk about VI in this class. To finish up, you could probably just close this. There's a couple ways to deal with a virtual machine. You can suspend it, and it will just basically freeze the machine in place by taking a person and putting a freeze spray on them, and they stop moving. You can also shut it down completely, so it's almost like turning off the power but it's in a little window. So your overall computer will stay on, but the little window t turns off and think it's, its power is going down. So the top right has got this little button, and either you know that's a power icon or you don't. I didn't for a while and was very confused. So this circle with a dash to the top of it is your power options. You can do things like lock screen, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. You can log out and become a different user. So suspend and hibernate will shut the machine down temporarily, but then you come right back to where you were. For now, we're just going to go ahead and do a full shutdown. So it's good to pay attention to what you're shutting down. Are you shutting down the actual computer where the power is going to actually turn off, or are you shutting down a virtual machine? And if you're running Linux with a virtual machine inside, if you think you're in full screen mode, you might not be. And so you may actually shut off the whole machine when you meant to shut off just the virtual machine. So pay attention. Yeah, it can be a little weird and confusing. You'll eventually get it. So here you can see Ubuntu is shutting itself off and is now powered down, except for no power has changed. And we're back to Windows. It's going to take a little while to get used to that, and, but hopefully the great thing is you put that on a USB stick, you go home, go to another country, go out to sea, it's on a USB stick. You copy that file to a workstation on a ship, 
We use it a whole bunch. If you forget that file on the disk that's on some other machine and you went home with your USB stick, you still have it. It hasn't gone anywhere. You just made a copy. You can give it to other people on the ship. If you've got stuff that you've all set up for processing a particular kind of data, for example, the weather station here, you could give that to another ship. They could then turn on, change the addresses in there to point at their weather station, and boom, you've got a weather station processing system all from a little file. The whole thing was you, you bring your USB stick with the file. You have to have a VMware player on those computers. Yes, and I highly recommend that USB stick. You can put the installer for VMware player on it for Windows and Linux and Mac. And so you could have everything you need and be able to walk up to almost any machine and get going.